Enough. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Healthy Cooking with Shada. I'm your host, and today we are going to continue our conversation that we've been having with John Pierre. And I'm really excited about today's topics. We're going to talk about food addiction, and I know JP has a lot to say about food addiction. But before we start, a couple of things that I want to bring to your attention. One, if you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, please consider doing so. And please to make sure to share this video with all your friends and family, because we want to spread the news as much as possible. Second thing is, I know there's going to be a lot of questions out there. So in order to make things easier for Aaron, when you're typing in your questions, if you could start it out with three question marks, ask your question, end it with three more question marks, this will make it easier for Aaron to, to find your questions and to make sure that, you know, that we get to it. This will be a two-part series. So I just want to let you know that if we don't get to all your questions today, we will definitely come back and we will be addressing all the questions. So don't feel like we're ignoring the questions today. So without much further ado, I'd like to welcome our guest for today, John Pierre. Welcome, JP. Hi, thank you. Thanks for having me. Welcome, everyone. Are we recording? Yes, we are recording, and it's always Good. a pleasure to have you. Good. So we're recording, so I know there's lots of people that are going to watch the recorded yeah. version. So welcome, everyone. So for those who don't know me, who haven't seen me before, um, I've been teaching for about 37 years, been vegan almost 40, backgrounds really in geriatrics, uh, particularly enhancing cognitive functioning in seniors, did a lot of programs also on fall prevention, Parkinson support group, things like that. I started working a lot more with abused women about 30 years ago. And as I saw more and more abused women, and of course I worked at women and children shelters, so there was kids there too. These people are in a, a state of constant uh, turmoil and trauma. A lot of them have PTSD. Some of them have complex PTSD, uh, a lot of emotional issues going on. And a lot of them had lots of addictions, particularly alcohol and drugs. But the one addiction they most certainly all had uh, was processed food addiction. And I think it's important that we understand that when I talk about food addiction, I'm not really talking about potatoes and beans and, and broccoli. I'm talking about processed foods. So if you look at the United States today, we have about 96 million uh, Americans that are obese, 96 million. Now, those folks didn't become obese uh, because they were eating too much, again, broccoli slaw and salad and carrots and things like that. They became obese by eating you know, processed foods. And one of the things you need to understand is that this industry, the processed food industry, is a very, um, it's a very secretive and very competitive industry. Uh, there's deep, deep science that goes behind these processed foods that they create. And they guard those, those formulas like, um, like nuclear launch codes. I mean, this is a serious uh, industry because what they've done is they've found formulas to create what they in the industry call um, a bliss point, a point that just goes so high in your brain that the bells are just ringing and you, all, you're, all you're hearing is ding dong, ding dong, ding dong, because they just kept hitting that bliss point. And you're just a full blown food addict now. And no different than if you were exposed to heroin or cocaine or another addictive substance. It's the same thing. What they've done, unfortunately, and unscrupulously, is they've hired. If you can imagine walking into one of these corporations, and every time somebody walked in to go to work, they had a little name tag, you would see chemist, biologist, physicist, psychologist, neuroscientist, marketing expert blending experts. It's like, there's nobody there that needs to be a dietitian or a nutritionist. What do they need that for? I mean, these products, there's nobody that thinks these products are healthy. I mean, they're all literally drugs and they're designed and it would only make sense in America. People want to make profit. They're designed to make you addicted to those substances. So what do you think that you keep doing? You keep purchasing them, right? I mean, if I was to sell you a pen, that you only need it once, it lasted 100 years, and I sold that pen for only 10 bucks, it's probably not that good of an idea. But if I sold you a pen for two bucks and you needed a new pen every month, 
that person would be a heck of a lot more wealthy because you've become more dependent then on their product. And that's what this food industry has done. So I want to talk about, you know, a lot that I've seen, of course, I've seen the research and, you know, I've, I've, I've done quite a bit of research into this, this unfortunate problem, but I've learned probably just as much, if not more from the clients that I've had for 37 years, because almost everyone that's come to me has had some sort of some form of processed food addiction. So I want you to understand that one of the things that I've worked with Shada from day one um, is to try to, to, give, to try to to get more of a whole food plant-based diet. And by whole foods, we just mean simply just remember, I wanted Shada to eat foods that grew from the ground, okay, or grew from trees. So fresh fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes like beans, peas, um, lentils, you know, tubers, of course, you know, potatoes, sweet potatoes, things like that. And those are foods that give us naturally, they give us a little bit of this dopamine juice, right? This pleasure juice in the brain, and they make us happy. So we continue to eat food. What I wanted her to do was to stay away from the processed, even vegan foods, because again, those are chemically formulated and they're designed to make you crave more because the amount of what we call the unholy trinity, salt, oil, you know, and sugar. And so I wanted her to stay away from that. If she just would do that, that would make her food addiction or anyone else's food addiction go down substantially because she's not exposing herself to these addictive substances. So that's one of the first things. And most of you hopefully know that, that that's what we're aiming for is a whole food plant-based diet that is salt-free, oil-free, and sugar-free. And in many cases, not all cases, but even flour-free. And of course, we want to avoid alcohol and tobacco and things like that. But just the SOS, the salt, oil, and sugar are critical. So do you remember, Shada, when we started working, how that was really an emphasis, uh, was eating just you know foods that grew from the ground or from trees, et cetera? Oh, absolutely. And I remember you coming to my apartment and checking my refrigerator and wanting to make sure that my, my, my refrigerator is stocked with lots of fresh fruits, and fresh vegetables and, you know, rice, beans, potatoes, you wanted all the other stuff out. Like you went through all my covers, you threw what you wanted out. You didn't throw it out. You just pushed it back and stuff like that. But you really wanted me to make sure that I, and I stuck to what you, you said to do. So I remember yeah. that quite vividly. And do you remember what I, need, I needed to use a little pen with? I had to mark something. Okay, okay. So for those of you, you may have heard me tell this story before, but the weekend before JP and I started working together where he was coming to my apartment, I had my friends over. Well, I had probably about eight or 10 girls that came over and we spent the weekend together that these guys love to drink wine and alcohol. I'm not, I've never been a drinker. I've been maybe a social drinker where I may have one glass for the entire night or maybe one drink every six months. So I, you know, for me, I would rather they come to my apartment, drink there, it's safer than to go out to a bar and go walking or driving or anything like that. So on Sunday night, when they left, there was all on my counter, there was like, I don't know, JP, I don't know if you remember, maybe eight or 10 bottles of wine. I, yeah. Do you remember? I, I don't yeah, remember. It was almost a dozen bottles of booze. Okay, those, <laughs> but they were all empty. And then I was just so tired that I didn't throw them out. And I thought, well, you know, tomorrow morning, I'll get up, Monday morning, I'll get up and I'll, and I'll, and I'll take care of it. Well, JP comes over and I had not taken care of it. And he walks in and the look on his face, I thought he was going to pass out or faint. He looks at all the empty bottles of alcohol. He doesn't say anything to me. He opens the refrigerator. He opens the freezer. And I had completely forgotten that there was a bottle of vodka um, in the freezer. And I'm not sure if there was vodka and if there was anything else like tequila or something like that but I remember the vodka and he closes it and he looks at me and he goes do we have a drinking problem here and I said honest to god I'm not a drinker this is this, and probably a lot of you know people that have a drinking problem will say no 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 not me I don't have a drinking problem but I, I really didn't 
And I remember him taking his pen out and marking on the vodka bottle in the freezer and marking a line there. And every single time he came to my apartment, he would open up that freezer and he would check to see that the line had not changed. Uh, that I remember. Right. And so that really brings us to our second point, which is once we first get rid of the foods or processed foods that are ringing your bell in your brain, causing what I call ding dong, it's kind of like the, the ding dong of you know your front door and you go running to the door and then you open the door, right? And it's like, after you eat whole foods, that's our first goal. But the second thing we need to do is we need to constantly monitor our environment. So our environment has to be sanitized. It has to be clean. Because once we cleaned out and made sure everything was, was you know, okay in your refrigerator and freezers and, you know, things like that, like you said, the alcohol wasn't going to be a problem. So I have to somewhat trust you, but I wanted to verify. So that's why I marked it. But yeah, they, I know, they, I know you had to verify because whatever I said, you didn't know me well enough. At that right, time. exactly. Right, yeah. right, right. So, so the point is, is that once we eat a whole food plant-based diet, which is our goal, then we need to make sure that I want you guys to write this down and memorize it, but you need to sanitize your environment. And that goes for your environment at home. That goes for your environment at work. And the trickier part is the environment, and, and listen carefully to what I say here, that you allow yourself in. So if you allow yourself to go into the big box stores, you know, and you go shopping there, then you've set yourself up to smell the Cinnabons that they're sampling or the pork sausage they're sampling or the booze or whatever it is they sample there. You've set yourself up. So you put your addictive brain into an addictive environment. And don't blame yourself when you fall victim to it, because, you know, you're this is it's kind of like if you stick yourself with a pin, you're going to go, ouch, it's naturally it's ingrained in you to eat those foods. So I don't want you to blame yourself, but you can be rest assured that you will be going toward those foods. And if you're not going to those foods, that thought is going to be banging in your brain. And that's not what you want, because if you have enough thoughts banging in your brain, it's going to weaken you. And that's not what you want. You don't want to get something called decision fatigue that you've made so many decisions and you've so you've used so much willpower throughout the day that when it becomes 6 30 or 7 at night, you don't have anything left in your in your battery. And so you give in to whatever next temptation comes. So as you know, Shada, we worked quite a bit on your environment, but also we worked on your environment when you went away. If you remember when you went on vacation. You had to take photos of your meals. You had to text me. You had to call. <laughs> you, oh, you I remember, that? Yeah, I remember that quite well. It was uh, JP and I had just started wor uh, working together and I was going to a wedding in San Francisco. It was my friend's wedding and I was in a booth in a wheelchair and I was really scared. And JP had promised me that he would hold my hand the entire weekend. And I was really scared of going. And I remember you came over and you brought me vitamin or green. You brought me um, a shaker so I could make my protein shakes in there and, and to have. Um, you gave me really good advice as to what to do. And then the one thing you told me is like, no matter what time it is or at any time I was supposed to, if I were going to put anything, and I mean anything in my mouth, I had to take a picture of it and I had to send it to JP. And he also wanted to know if I, you know, to make sure that the hotel that we were staying at was close to a Whole Foods or a Trader Joe's or something. And he wanted me to show him, like, if I bought something, I had to show him. And listen, guys, I was on the honor system because, it, you know, I wasn't about to cheat myself. Yeah, I could have lied to JP and ate something and not told him about it. But that would be defeating the purpose. And like I said, I've always said that when I went into this, I went in 120%, like 200%. I wasn't going to lie to myself and I wasn't about to lie to him because he was trying to help me. So at the wedding, I told him, I'm like, well, what am I going to do? Because, you know, before the wedding and all that, yes, I went to the Whole Foods and I bought food and I took pictures of my salads and my fresh fruits and all that. So he knew I did all that. And I would have the... Um, the protein powder, I would have the vitamin or green and everything. And then for the wedding, he told me just go find the mater d and talk to him and tell him about your food allergies and what you can and cannot eat. But the best advice JP gave me was 
don't make it complicated for the mater d keep it as simple as possible so that whatever you want you can get and it was at that point when i got to the wedding i asked the mater d if they could make me when they bring out the salads for everyone else if they could bring me the same salad with all the raw vegetables put no dressing on there um, if they had plain balsamic vinegar, I would take it. If they had lemon slices, I would take it and some fresh fruit. And they did that for me. When it was time for the main course, I asked if they had any potatoes or any kind of maybe steamed vegetables. And they were able to accommodate me with the, um, with the potatoes and the um, steamed vegetables. And then for dessert, when everybody else got cake, they brought me a big, beautiful plate of uh, fresh fruit. And I did. I took, before I put anything in my mouth, I took a picture of it and I would send it to him. And I got to tell you guys, I was really impressed because at one point, I think it was like 10 o'clock at night or 11 o'clock at night. I texted him. I think it was pictures of fruit or something. And he responded. He would respond after every single text. So thank you, JP, for that wonderful hand holding uh, that weekend. Because I I, I don't know if I would have made it through without having a coach like you by my side. I really don't. And I think everyone who's struggling, you really need to have to have a coach. And I certainly had one of the best. So thank you. Yeah. And, you know, that that environment is so critical because remember, the one thing that, that people need to understand is that even healthy food is anchored in your brain to lots of pleasure, especially when you were a kid, you had all your meals with your families, you had holidays and a loved one might've passed away and it could be a parent uh, or any relative. And you remember always eating that particular food with that loved one. And so every time you think about that food, it brings you back to your relationship with that parent or relative and it brings you a lot of pleasure. So these, 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 these chemicals in our brain are very powerful and they're designed um, to, to basically make sure to ensure your survival. And so the whole reason that when you eat a potato or some beans that your brain releases these, these what I call pleasure juices is because it ensures your survival. But the problem is nature didn't take into account that man would create cocaine would create heroin, would create white sugar and create you know, all these artificial flavors and sweeteners. So instead of ringing the pleasure bell in your brain every so often, now not only are you ringing the pleasure bell constantly, but massive, massive bell is ringing. It's not like just a little ding, ding, ding. It's like a huge church bell going off. So you have to understand that you really have to work exceptionally hard to prevent this food addiction. And to be honest with you, it's almost impossible in our society today, if you live in the real world, not to have some sort of food addiction. It's very, very difficult and you have to work exceptionally hard. But the good news is that if you do work exceptionally hard, you will get to a certain level that you're able to you know, pretty much outsmart it, not so much out willpower it most of the time, but you can outsmart it. And that's why it was so adamant about Shada being so accountable because we really had just started working out and I needed her to get through the first week and then the second week and the third week. I need to develop momentum with her. And if I didn't develop momentum, we'd have to go all the way back from day one. And, and that's just not what we want to do. So make sure you understand whole food plant-based diet is our goal. And then keeping a sanitized environment is our next important goal. And that not only means in your home, but it also means at your work, in your car, when you go on vacation and where you choose, make sure you, you understand I'm saying that you're choosing to go shopping at that store and you're choosing to go to that restaurant with your friends. So if you just get, got out of um, rehab for 60 days of being an alcoholic, it wouldn't be a good idea for you and I just to go to a tavern to throw darts. Even though we're not planning on having you drink, it wouldn't be a good idea because of all the triggers and the temptations that would be there. So keep that environment clean. Now, the third thing I wanna talk about is something that I've been mentioning for years, and that's this whole temptation, this I'm just gonna have things in moderation. I'm just gonna try a little bit of that cake. That's all I want, a little taste of it. And I call that dancing with the devil. 
if you're going to dance with the devil, you can rest assured that you're not going to get out of that, that dance. You're going to be stuck there. So you need to be very conscientious and very strong and smart to make sure that you don't give in to the slightest temptation, especially if you have a predisposition toward addiction. And many times these things run in the family. They are partially genetic, but they also are just wired into our brain, uh, you know, these addictions, you know, because everyone should be addicted to sugar, oil, and salt because they ensured our survival, you know, from the beginning of time. So it's nothing to be sad about or like your fault. It's ingrained in you. Just like if I stuck a pin in your arm and you went, ouch, that's nothing to be embarrassed about. That's how nature designed you, that you have pain receptors. And when something comes in that could damage your, your, your tissues, you're supposed to pull away from it. Okay. So what you just need to remember is that like, for instance, Shada, why don't you just quickly tell uh, the story about, I don't remember what cake that was, but um, you passed it, you kept it going when we were at uh, Chef AJ's house. And that's an important story because if you would have danced with the devil there and had a bite of so-called healthy, health, it, I guess that was an SOS free cake, I don't recall. It, it was, and it was um, Chef AJ and John Pierre put a class together, uh, it was called Unprocessed. And it was the first night that we were all getting together. Now, JP and I had started working together. And I believe we have worked out like a couple of times or two yeah. or three times mm -hmm. at that point. So we had just started working together. And we're all sitting in AJ's living room. We kind of like sat in this big old circle. There was probably, what, about 20, 22 of us. Right. And we had just had a wonderful class. And we had already had dinner. AJ always made dinner for us. And. As you all know, she is, um, she does make a lot of healthy foods, but there, at that point, it was a lot of um, dates and it was all natural stuff. It wasn't, it was SOS free. Um, I think she, it was a chocolate peanut butter uh, cheesecake that she had made. And I remember JP sat across the way from me and we really, JP never in the whole time that we were working together has never ever from day one said you can't have this and you can't have that and I want you to avoid this and I want you to avoid that. So I remember that night at the end of class, AJ brings out this chocolate cheesecake and says, hey guys, um, who wants a slice or a piece of this cheesecake? Well, of course, everybody that was there raises their hand, including myself, um, and we all like, oh my God, this is going to be so good. And it's not like she was giving us big portions. Mind you, it's a nine inch cheesecake and it's getting divided by like 22 people, right? So everybody's just taking a slice. Um, and in my head, uh, I was thinking, oh my God, this is going to be so good. I'm so excited. I can't wait to have a piece of this. And remember, JP still has not said one word to me. He sat across. And it was really kind of funny because as the cheesecake came around and as it got closer to me, I think Zena was sitting next to me. It came to her and all of a sudden, I don't know what happened. JP and I just locked eyes. And I mean, we literally just locked eyes. And before you know it, as that cheesecake came into my hand, that cheesecake went to the next person and it completely went around the room. And I'm like, hey, wait a minute. I never had the cheesecake. And it was actually one of the most powerful moments I think in my whole journey because that right there taught me that I did not need to have it and again JP never said you can't have it and you know all we did was lock eyes but that was to me that was one of the most powerful moments and it was at that moment that I truly said to myself you know what maybe one day I never tell myself I cannot have something I always tell myself I'm choosing not to have it at this time. And I told myself, you know what? I don't need to have this right now. Maybe ah, one day I'll have it. And then I remember at the end of class, I told AJ, I said, you know what? For my 10 year anniversary of being whole food plant-based SOS free, I want you to make this chocolate uh, peanut butter cheesecake. And I want to have a piece because I, I didn't have it tonight. She goes, okay, well, let me tell you guys, 10 years has come and gone. And I still did. I, I haven't had it. And I told AJ, I'm like, yeah, you don't need to make it for me. So that was really, that was a, for me, it was a really powerful moment. It sure was. And that was again, a, a perfect example of not dancing with the devil. And although that was a whole food, it was completely fine and acceptable. And of course, the, the thing we'd be dancing with the devil with, especially if it was processed, 
but there's an exception. And that is when you start taking natural foods, which in nature, we would not be eating handfuls of dates and we surely wouldn't be eating handfuls of nuts because they'd be too hard to procure to get. And if we did find them, we'd be saving them for winter when there was less food available. The problem is these healthy foods, when they're combined, just like peanut butter and jelly or dates and peanut butter, they create not scientifically a bliss point, but they're basically creating a very similar high in your brain that once those two ingredients get combined together and maybe throwing a little salt in there, I don't know if there was salt in there or not. I guess probably with AJ, there wouldn't be, but you throw in at least two of those healthy ingredients, the dates and the peanuts or any other fat, and you're hitting like a bliss point. And just like all these people now that are in the whole food, you know, plant-based SOS free movement, I got news for you. Lots of these people are absolute crazy food addicts to these types of little snacks. These, I don't know what they call them, Shada, but you know, you've seen them made. They're like little muffins almost. And they're made with oats and lots of fruits and things like that. And there's nothing wrong with them. But when you combine them together, it basically creates a cookie. And so what happens is even though it's healthy for you, it's not healthy for the brain in terms of addiction. And if you're prone to addiction, it's not healthy for you. And where it's also a problem is once your palate gets used to this sweetness, the bells go off in the brain, ding dong, ding dong, ding dong. And later on in the day, you want more ding dong, right? And so then you're inclined to go to that stuff. And then before you know it, now you're not eating the date and the peanut butter and oat um, cookie or cake. Now you're going for a little bit thing that has a little bit more processed sugar in it. Maybe now it has a little oil and it just keeps getting worse like any other drug addiction. So d- dancing with the devil is not going to be a good idea. You're not a Navy SEAL. You don't have the ability to resist and have discipline or else you wouldn't be in this predicament in the first place. I tell most all my clients. So Shada, if you, if you notice that everything we did is, is everything in the order I'm talking about today, whole food, plant-based diet, sanitize the environment. And then of course, don't dance with the devil. The next thing that's important to understand in in this game, please write it down, make note of it. This is the most important point here is that cookies and ice cream are just really band-aids for your stress and your worries and your trauma and a broken relationship. They're not going to heal that relationship. They're not going to take away the trauma that occurred. All they're doing is putting a band-aid on that sensation that you're feeling. So if you break your arm, and you put a Band-Aid on, it may look good that you have a Band-Aid on, but it's not doing anything for the underlying break in the humerus or the femur or whatever you broke. And so you need to understand that you're medicating with these foods because you're having a sensation that you don't like. And I hear it all the time. People will say to me, they just broke up with their, their boyfriend or their girlfriend and they went home and they ate you know, a, a, whatever they shouldn't be eating, or they went to the store and got a Uh, a quart of vegan ice cream and some Oreos and things like that. Or somebody saw something that, uh, uh, that made them sad and they, you know, ate or they, you know, went on a bender. So this is where this section here is the most important because you need to address your issues. So that's why, as I've told you before, I work with lots of different therapists and many of them are trauma therapists and you have to treat trauma. You just can't have, just think by just having a clean diet um, is going to take away the issues that occurred to you when you were 10 years old. It's great you're eating a clean diet, but you definitely need to deal with traumas that you've had and you have to deal with these sensations. Maybe you're hypervigilant all the time. So you're constantly on like a deer and you don't like that feeling of being wound up. So you're eating excess amounts of sugar to kind of calm you down. So these are things that need to be addressed is that always remember these processed foods are just like you taking a drug. They're taking the sensation that you're feeling away, but they're not dealing with the underlying problem. Does that make sense? That makes total sense. And I remember you always saying in order, in order to fix this, you have to fix this. I remember you always saying that always. And one of the things that I, I, I tried to, you know, really instill with you was you need to find pleasure in things other than food. So for you, you love to work out. You love cardio kickboxing. 
you know, you love walking and these things. And so that's why I encouraged you to make sure that you include these in your life because, you know, I have a Zoom series, Shady, you saw it, 17 hour Zoom series on johnpierre.com and it's called the Pillars of Health. And one of the first things, the first lecture I do there is on food addiction. And I talk about that you can have your three dopamine blasts a day with food, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And then that's the end of the dopamine blast and the fun from food. The rest of your fun now has to come from life. And you need to figure out, you need to make a list of things that you can do that go ding dong in the brain and make you happy. So, you know, obviously, like for me, I've been volunteering for, well, gosh, I've been working with abused women for 30 years and animal rights even longer than that. So, you know, volunteering is an important part of my life. And it, it's a very, um, you know, satisfying thing to know that I'm doing something good for the planet, for animals, for people and things like that. If you like music, you know, you should be, you know, having music throughout the day. If you have a certain show you like, well, save that show. You know, don't, don't just blast yourself with all this dopamine all at once. Maybe save that show to the end of the night when most people have a low and now they need a high and they reach for, for food, save some fun for at night for whatever it is you like to do. But I would suggest that you make a list of things that you enjoy that bring you pleasure and that go ding dong in the brain. Now, remember that you're not gonna generally, not always, but I'm just generalizing, most of the things that we like to do, it's not fair to compare the high that we get with those with an artificial drug. So in other words, just like in the natural movement, People say, well, if you have pain, you can use this natural herb. Yeah, that's true. That works to a certain degree, but it's not going to be as powerful as morphine. So don't expect that when you have, a, a, you, know, a, you know, something you like doing, listening to music or watching a show, it's not going to artificially uh, go ding dong on your brain the way heroin would or cocaine. So here's the secret. It will when you eventually get rid of those artificial ding dongs. So just like when you're a monk and you're eating every day, you have rice and vegetables, that's your natural dopamine blast. And you go walk outside and you see the birds. You're not used to anything else that's a super high. So those little things, the natural things in life, bring you lots of enjoyment and they bring enough dopamine to make you happy. The problem is, and, and I want you to really understand this because this applies to food addicts totally. If you're driving on the expressway 70 miles an hour, and you take an exit, and now you're supposed to be going down the street with stoplights and everything at 35, you're doing 50, and you feel like you're going too slow, right? You're going to get a ticket or hurt somebody. But the reason is, is because you were just going 70 or 75, and now going 50 seems really slow, but it's not. 50 is still too fast. That's why the monks in the people who live a simple lifestyle, they're not being overstimulated all the time. So they're completely calm and content and they get a little dopamine blast from eating the rice, from seeing a tree and a bird and seeing a, a running stream. But you will never have that type of serenity and calm, stable brain if you're always driving at 75, meaning you're eating processed foods. Natural foods are not gonna be able to compete with the same high you get from cocaine and heroin. Does that make sense, Shada? Oh, absolutely. And you hit the nail on the head because like you said, I do love to work out. Even at my highest weight, I was still working out. And and I guess you and I, you know, you know how much I love boxing and kickboxing. So you and I started to do a lot of pad work and boxing and we did a lot of other stuff and hiking once I got the boot off my leg and um, just trying to find joy in other things than always reaching for, you know, for or going to restaurants or going um, to places where there's going to be a plethora of foods. So I, no, I totally agree with you. You know, it's interesting that you say that going to restaurants and stuff. You know, it's so interesting because when, when I would be seeing clients or from people would be coming out of town, different companies or um, experts that would call me and want to get together, and they'd say, hey, do you want to go meet at so-and-so vegan restaurant? I'd say, hey, how would you like to meet at the park? Or how would you like to meet at this hiking trail? Because what I'm trying to do is, is let people know that there's more um, fun in life than just sitting down and eating a meal. We can also have the same amount of fun. And it could be more productive and healthier for you if we go for a walk. 
As a matter of fact, in Chicago at my office, when I was seeing clients around the clock, almost a good majority, almost all of them that had any sort of cognitive depression or anything, almost all of those, um, I would take out for a walk as we did our session. Certainly well, like as a new client, I would see, I would uh, you know, sit in the office the first session, but after that, we'd go for a walk. Even the first time I met you, we, we met on a hiking trail. I remember that. We met on a hiking trail and I thought, oh, we're going to get, you know, sit. And you're like, no, 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 no. We're going to get up and walk around. I remember that. Yeah. It's just that it's, it's why not get your body moving and get associating, you know, interacting with people that doesn't always have to be interacting eating. Because the problem is, is that it has a tendency to create people to overeat also. And they're also eating foods that are at a restaurant and most restaurants, at least, especially back in the day, will salt, will salt, oil, sugar. Now we're starting to see some restaurants are, have SOS free, which is great. Uh, but I'd still encourage people to move. And speaking of moving, moving is one of the best ways to get a high. You know, we have these brain derived neurotrophic factors. They're kind of like brain fertilizer and they get activated doing different things in life, but, but one of the, the, the way they express themselves one of the most efficiently is through movement. So every time we're engaging in movement and exercise, you know, not only do we release endorphins, which are brain stimulating and they can take away pain, but we're also getting those brain derived neurotrophic factors going so we can develop more connections in our brain. And just, just movement in general is gonna be healthy for circulation, oxygenation, um, it's just better for your self-esteem. It's creating bone density. It's strengthening your muscles. So I would highly encourage as one of your to-dos for pleasure is put down some form of movement. And that could be dancing. Heck, you can just turn on the radio and just dance a little bit, even if it's a couple minutes throughout the day. But that music's going to stimulate you. And then the movement's going to stimulate you. And it's giving you the high. And pretty soon you're going to get used to these highs and you still have the processed food high. It's not going to quite compete. But as that processed food starts being eliminated from your diet, this high is going to replace that. And you're going to feel completely fine and, and healthy that way. So these food, these food addictions are really serious, gang. And you need to take them serious. And you need to stack the deck in your favor to do everything you can to counter uh, this from taking place. Because I'm telling you, once you dance with the devil it's going to be really tough. And if Shaded didn't lock eyes with me and pass that uh, cake, we would have just had a tough week because I know her brain would have been banging for more of that cake, wanting more sweets. And her brain wouldn't be happy with salads and sprouts and some potatoes and beans. It wouldn't be. It's impossible because it's just not natural. You've artificially stimulated the brain. That's why people get addicted to narcotics when they get an injury they have to be very careful, especially if they're uh, somebody who already has an addictive personality, because those drugs take over your brain and it's just remember, not natural. Do you remember, um, I think it was a couple of years ago when I made those, um, those truffle balls, yep. uh, the cran and I call them cranberry bliss balls. Yep. And you, you were at my house and I remember you telling me, you're like, she pulled me aside and you're like, you better cut this stuff out. I don't want you making any more of these. And I'm like, why? He goes, I'm just telling you, I don't want you making these. And I came to realize that even though something that we may make that salt, oil, sugar, flour, everything free, you look, you still look at these and these can be triggers to get us to want to eat more of other things. And I've learned now that even though some of these desserts that everybody's making could be really, really healthy, I think I prefer not to have it and just stick with the whole food and just have fresh fruits because I, I don't like JP says, I don't want to start dancing with the devil. And I, I don't think I've made those chocolate um, cranberry bliss balls since then. I may have made it for Christmas and I passed them out to my neighbors because I know they really love it, but to make them on a regular basis anymore, I don't because even though I know what's going in it, I'm making it and I know they're pretty clean. There's still things in there that are uh, that could be triggers, and I we we don't we don't want any of that. And some well, of these, what was ahead. the ingredients in there? Tell everybody the ingredients. Well, there was 100 percent what pure chocolate chips with no sugar added. There was hazelnuts. There was dates. Uh, there was cram fresh cranberries. There was coconut. 
And I think that's really about it. Maybe a little bit of um, orange zest and a little bit of orange juice. And that was it. I mean, it wasn't, oh, there was also um, uh, rolled oats that were that, like for the flour, it was ground. I mean, ground. it can't get any worse than that, Shada. No, I, I know, but what I'm saying is I had to stop making it because you're right. That, that could lead to other things. And right now you see a lot of these whole food plant-based people that are creating these yes. beautiful, 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 beautiful desserts, cakes, cookies, shakes, uh, smoothies, puddings, you name it, they're creating them. And I'm looking at that and my brain's going, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to stick to the fruit and that's yeah. it. Yeah. Well, and, and that's a great example, Shady, because it's, I do remember when that occurred and I remember you, you know, talking to you about it because I was concerned about it, but that recipe right there, that's like the poster child for addiction. It must've been the tastiest thing on the planet and it's all healthy stuff. But what I'm saying is that those foods are so, even though they're healthy, it's the combination of them together that really causes the problem. And once you get your taste buds going and the sugar, you have taste that sugar and then you taste that fat and they taste the flour and it does the, the zest of the, um, the orange peel and things like that. I mean, you've really created, you know, something that's very interesting. And I don't think there's many people that would be able to turn those down. And when they're driving home, they're thinking about that. And when they get home, they're thinking about it. And if they can't get that, what you gave them, they can't make it or they don't make it they're going to find something to replace it. And it may just be a spoonful of peanut butter and some jelly on bread. Oh, I, I agree with it. Who was the client that you were working with and I gave you a whole box of those and, and she really loved them. And, and she's like, yeah, I, I think that was a celebrity client. We, we won't talk about who, but I think that was a celebrity. <laughs> yeah. I, I remember that she really loved them. And you're yeah, like, of course. no, 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 no. We're, we're, we're not doing, you tried one of them and you're like, yeah, that one's enough. But. Yeah. You know, the thing is like those to me are as tasty as can be. There's nobody that's going to deny they're tasty, but it's just, again, if you don't have an addictive personality that helps. And if you have control that helps, but I got news for most of you, that's not you. Right. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that you can't dance with the devil. So what I'm saying is you need to stack the deck in your favor, right? If you're a Navy seal, you can eat one potato chip, and then say, I'm not going to have any more. Although m m many of these military people who are really tough and strong, they've got all sorts of other addictions. They've got alcohol and drug, tobacco, things like that, pornography addictions. So these addictions run, run wide. And just because you can control one thing doesn't necessarily mean you can control everything. So my suggestion is why should you get in a battle with this substance and you know, and then have to battle it out. Why not just completely avoid it is what I'm suggesting here. And I think that's a clear way because if we were uh, talking to an alcoholic, we certainly would not say, uh, or, or an alcoholic would not say, oh, just have a little tiny bit of alcohol. It's not gonna right. hurt. So why would we do that with the other stuff? And JP, how does one know that they're a true, I don't know what a true food addict is, but because you know nobody wants to define it, but how do you know if you have that addictive personality? Well, uh, the, there, there are two separate things. There's a genetic component to it, ha having to do with neurotransmitters and the way serotonin things works, you're more susceptible to addiction. That's one thing, that's a genetic thing. And you can generally see that. It's not always identified this way, but you can see it by looking in your family and seeing how much, how, how much relatives, what type of addictions they have, you can maybe then say, mm, you know, I might be a little bit prone to addiction since everybody in the family was either an alcoholic or drug user or something like that. Uh, but I think that most everybody in the United States is a food addict because it'd be the same thing as if I said, if you take a pin and you stick it in somebody's arm in the United States, do so they go, oh, yeah, because you're wired to be a food addict. You're wired to want to eat these foods because these foods ensured your survival thousands of years ago. And we really haven't changed much from thousands of years ago, especially the reptilian brain that's based on survival, fight or flight. You know, it's all about survival. So I think most of us are, but an easy way to do it is if, if I have myself, um, I don't know, what could I have? Say I'm, I'm with friends and 
there's some new vegan potato chip. I could just take one of the potato chips and eat it. And I'd say, boy, this is delicious. This is great. It'd be fun and wonderful to eat a whole bag, right? And that's what most people would do. Now, I would just say, oh, okay, it's wonderful and delicious, but I'm not going to have any more. But that's just me. That might not be you. Most likely, that's not you. No, so, that's not, that's not yeah, me at all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, but, but in, yeah, and, and that just has more of a, um, that's a kind of complicated answer. It's not that I have any, I'm any different or better than somebody. It's just that I just make that choice that I just don't want those types of foods, but it doesn't mean I don't think they taste good. Cause I do think they taste good for sure. If, some, if somebody, so would that also be for someone who may eat way too many potatoes, way too, yes, many, thank you. Way too many fruits? I mean, I know me when, and, and you know, this about me when it's pomegranate season, all bets are off because I am over, I, and I know this myself that I do overeat on um, pomegranate. So to me, that seems like that that's kind of somewhat of a, that's a food addict kind of thing, right? Yep. Well, yeah. I mean, thank you for saying what you're saying, because this is where I've gotten in somewhat of um, a disagreement with a lot of the people out there that are saying you can eat all the potatoes and rice and, you know, whole foods you want. Well, I haven't seen that in all my clients. I'm just telling you what I've seen. I've said to a lot of my clients, hey, how do you do with white rice? Oh my God, I just keep eating it. How do you do with potatoes? I can't stop at just one. How are you doing with your weight? Well, yeah, I've got about 150 pounds to lose. So it's like, I have not seen everybody that can just eat all the potatoes and all the rice and all the stuff they want. Um, now, here's the, here's the interesting thing. You can eat all the potatoes and rice and these whole food plant-based foods and not necessarily have to worry about maybe heart disease or diabetes or something, but it doesn't mean it's not going to be converted to fat in your system. And it also, me, to me, more importantly than that is not even worried about somebody gaining weight as I am, they're feeding into compulsions and addictions, and they're unable to have a calm, stable brain. That's my concern because I think your goal should be to have a calm, stable brain and be a normal person and not have this bipolar uh, highs and lows, highs and lows, highs and lows. You want to have just kind of like the plains of the Midwest, just, just flat. So that's a good question, Shada. And I always ask my clients after I've known them for a while and they've been whole food plant-based and they've come from other programs, they say, how do you do with unlimited potatoes and rice? And I would say at least 70% of them say, I can't do that. So I have to have some sort of control. And that's when I go into sequencing meals. And then that's when I go into what I like my clients to do is when they're done eating their meal, I like them as soon as they're done, they look at their list of paper of all the fun things that they're, they can do. And I want to make sure they have one of those fun things planned. So they have the high from the meal. And as soon as they're done eating that meal, they're doing something else that keeps that high going for a while instead of more gorging on food. No, and, and I get it. And I've noticed that about myself, my mom, like my mom, she loves white rice. And yeah. She could eat white rice all day long. Me, yeah. myself, potatoes. I could eat potatoes all day long and I keep going back for more. And, and I'm not hungry, but I just go back. Pomegranates, as good as they are, I go back. Even but yeah, but I, like, but I don't overeat on broccoli. I don't overeat on <laughs> right. a lot of salads. Yeah, I don't. But I will overeat on potatoes, rice, beans, um, and fruit. Definitely fruit. Well, and that you're making a great point, and that's because the Wizard of Oz, the man behind the curtain here, is directing the show, is saying, "Look at Shada. Don't be filling up on broccoli because there's no calories in broccoli. There's a famine coming next week, so keep stockpiling those potatoes." get calories in your system, right? That's why nobody's a, a food addict goes out at midnight to get a broccoli slaw, right? They go for a Slurpee or pizza or chocolate sundae, right? Yeah, that, that, that is true. That is, yeah, that it's is those fun. foods don't, well, here's the secret though. Those foods don't ring the, the, the pleasure juice as effectively as the processed foods. But as I said earlier, once you aren't driving 70 miles an hour on the expressway, then you're not used to being overstimulated. So you can be happy driving 50 now, right? Or 40 or whatever it is. I, I think we all need to look within ourselves and see if, you know, how we really are, because there is a lot of people out there that are saying, eat at Liberum, 
all the potatoes you want, all the rice you want, all the vegetables you want, and all the fruit you want. I know for me personally, that's not the case with me. I can't, I can't do that. And, and so I've learned. Well, if you can do that, bless you. And that's wonderful with the exception is as long as eating like that doesn't drive you to be obsessed and have more compulsions and addictions, and you can't have a calm, stable brain. They're really two different issues. One is the weight gain, but the other is the one that I'm more concerned about with is having a calm, stable brain. If you feel you're compelled to constantly be pounding potatoes and rice and things like that, then, you know, then I'm concerned that there's an addiction there, though that's healthier than cocaine and heroin, for sure it's healthier. It still doesn't get you to what I say is the advanced level of having a calm, stable brain. Because I don't care if those potatoes were grown and blessed by monks in the Himalayans. It doesn't really matter if they're still leading you to not have a calm, stable brain. So how do you, if, if a client came to you who's on a whole food plant-based diet, and, but, but they are eating way too many potatoes, rice, beans, fruits, and all that, how would you, how would you work with them or what would you? Well, that's why most of my clients, first of all, I try to talk people out of seeing me. I say, look, I just buy my book, start the last two chapters, the most important thing, because that's on love and compassion. Start there. But the truth of the matter is what you're asking now, that takes hard work. See, everybody says, I want to look like Shada. I want to be able to do this for 11 years and keep the 150 pounds off in this. And then when I start telling them how much work it takes, they're like, oh, you mean you got to do all that and that and that? Yeah, it takes, it's hard work. So then Shada, to answer your question, that's when I do more introspection, more emotional and mental slash spiritual work. We rarely talk about diet anymore. You know, it's like, it's like when you and I talk, we don't really focus on, on checking out your diet as much anymore as your emotional state. But I will say this, just so people know, don't call me if you think that you're just going to work with me and I'm going to cast a magic wand on you and you're going to be okay and there's no work involved. Heck no. There's a lot of work involved. And I've actually had people say to me, oh man, I don't, I don't think I want to go there. I'm going to go in a different direction. That's fine. But I'm praying that different direction you're, you're choosing to go in, and I say this with all the love and kindness in the world, is directly to a therapist because that's what's required. I'm not a therapist. I'll help you with certain things, but most likely if your issues are deeper, I'm going to say, hey, I'd like to refer you to a trauma therapist to deal with some of these issues. I, I, yeah, it, it is, and I will agree to with what you're saying. It is a lot of work, uh, and it's also how badly do you want it, and if you really want it, you know, get a calm, stable brain, you're going to have to put in the time and the effort and do what JP is recommending, because I, I won't say that I'm 100%, but I am 95%. And I think that's huge. And if I do have a problem, I pick up the phone and I call JP and we just talk about it. Um, but again, if I'm overeating on anything, I'm not eating something that's going to hurt me. Because I remember you always used to say, are you are you fueling yourself or are you fooling yourself? Like are the foods that you're eating, are those hurting you or are those helping you? So at least the foods that I'm, if I'm eating too many potatoes one day, if I've had a bad day or something, at least I know the potatoes aren't hurting me. They're or not that, hurting you physically. Physically. Yes. But they, you know, it, well, it's better than me getting in my car and going to a drive through and getting God knows what, that, that yep. would really hurt me. That would hurt me. Uh, that, yeah, perfectly said. And hey, look, I understand. I'm not saying that everybody needs to be going to the level where they have to have this calm, stable brain immediately. It takes time. So yeah, I would I want all my clients to be gorging on potatoes and rice instead of hot dogs and hamburgers for their physical health. But as they work with me and they want to have a more of a, a you know, calm, stable brain and poised emotions then we don't want to have any addictions there, whether it's organic potatoes blessed by the monks. I don't care. It doesn't matter. We want to avoid any of those addictions, which is the goal ultimately down the line, but it takes work. And let's be fair to all the audience. When you first started working with Mesheda, which direction did you run in after the first session? Do I have to answer that? Yes, because I want people to see how hard this is. Well, when we first started working, I, I had one session with you and then I, I, I kind of went away. Yeah, but what were you doing during the first session? I was hiding from you. Yeah, but during the first session, you oh, were during crying. the first session, I was crying and because of all, you know, a lot of stuff was starting to come out and stuff and you were making me 
tap into um, emotional feelings I, I, I didn't want to tap into. You had already started getting into my head and I just didn't want to go there. Exactly. So, now that's, that statement is critical because nobody does, right? Nobody wants to go there and get healed because it takes work and it takes confronting your demons. And so that's why I'm saying when people call me, I prefer they say, hey, let's just talk about nutrition and fitness. We don't need to talk about my addictions and my problems. That's, that makes it so much easier because then we can talk, we can have kale chat. We can just talk about kale and beans and rice and we don't have to get to the core of your problem. And I'm not saying that to be funny because at first some people need that. Like I don't do that right away with people who um, are new to eating healthy. I have to just work with their diet, but for someone that's already um, been eating this way and they're coming with issues, then we have to address some of their issues to the best of my ability. And then I need to um, send them out to a therapist if, um, if, 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 if they're open to that. Is, is self-discipline important in approaching this? It's important, but most people don't have discipline. So that's why the work that you and I did, as you know, was designed to develop discipline in a, in a very gentle, loving, hand-holding way that you often didn't even know was happening. So yes, discipline is very important, but most of us don't have um, the discipline we need, but it can be trained and you can develop it for sure. And it is something you, you definitely should have to a certain extent, for sure. Right, because I know for, for a fact that willpower is not the answer. Because at some point you may have willpower today, tomorrow, but by the next day you'll cave in. So willpower That's, is not going to do it. For most people, you're not a military veteran or you're Navy SEAL or something. Willpower is not going to do it. That's not us. So that's why I'm saying you need to, to really clean your environment up so you don't have any temptations to dance with the devil. You, you don't want to be using your physical energy, you know, when you can be circumventing the, the, the stress and the trauma, for sure. No, that, that's very true. Um, well, this, this has been an absolutely fascinating conversation, and I know we're not done here. We're going to continue with this conversation. Um, we've been talking for about an hour now, JP, and I don't know about your schedule. We do have some questions that came in. Your, yeah, let's you answer some. Time, yeah, yeah. Answer I've got a couple of minutes. You've got a couple of minutes, so let's answer a few questions. And for those that have submitted questions that we don't get to right now, um, we are coming back because this conversation will continue on food addiction. So I'm going to have Erin go ahead and say what those questions are. Go ahead, Erin. Okay. So what to do if a food craving just pops into your thoughts without the trigger of a smell or being an environment that triggers you? So well, that's interesting. You know, there's a lot. Oh man, we could, that, that is a great question because we could talk about that for an hour. And I've had All right, let's wait another hour and let's do it. <laughs> Well, uh, believe it or not, there's a lot of triggers that happen subconsciously that people aren't, um, they're really not conscious of, especially odors and visual cues that happen and people don't understand it. Um, but one of the things you can do, as I said, you can use like uh, Health Force makes their vitamin mineral green and they make something also called greener grasses. And Shady was talking about that earlier that I gave that to her for her trip when she went out of town. And you just add about a tablespoon of that to a glass of water or a water bottle. And if you sip on it throughout the day, it alkalizes the palate. But if you have an immediate craving, you could just drink literally like, you know, a half a cup or a cup of it. And that helps. And that's one thing. You can also use an essential oil like clove, which numbs your tongue. You could take a drop of clove. A lot of my clients will put a drop of clove in um, about a half a glass of water swish for 45 seconds and then spit it out. And then that numbs their tongue. So it's for most people, uh, that's all they need. You can do the same thing with peppermint essential oil, uh, swish for 45 seconds and spit it out. So those are some things that you can do. Uh, but believe it or not, a lot of these cues, we can figure them out. We can, we can definitely figure them out. Um, it just, people are not necessarily always aware of odors and sense and images, uh, TV shows. Uh, if, you can, if you've ever read the book, Subliminal Seduction, uh, which talked about how the movie industry and the TV industry and the ad industry would play subliminal ads. And then they would test people and they'd see what they're craving. And indeed, it's what they flashed on the screen for whatever that was 100th of a second. 
you know, eat more popcorn type of thing. Yeah, and I wanted to talk about the vitamin grain. Um, I was at the Mother's Market and we, Aaron and I we went to Alaska and we just got back a couple of weeks ago. And when I went there, they actually have it. If you don't want to take the, the powder form, they now make it into capsules. And I don't know, JP, if what your thoughts are about these capsules, but I actually bought it by mistake. I thought I was actually buying the powder, but then, you know, we were leaving the next day. So, cause I don't, I don't leave home without this. Like if I travel anywhere, my vitamin green is always, always, always with me. So you yeah. could take, you could well, take it in a capsule form. Well, the, the, you don't want to take the capsule form if you're trying to alkalize your palate. So That's the idea true. is to alkalize your palate, swish it, swish the green in there as long as possible, takes away the sugar craving. You have to open up those capsules and then do that. Uh, if you just took the capsule, it'd be beneficial as a form of greens and antioxidants, though. Yeah, and that's what I did. And when you were talking about the clove, you had me try the clove, and that sucker is disgusting. Yeah. Like, I literally, um, I have the clove, and I will take it with me when I go to a party or something. Because if yeah. I know there's, there's, you know, foods there that are gonna, you know, play play games on my brain, I just put that on the tip of my tongue, and I'm like, oh my god, it's like, first yeah. of all, you're numb, and then the taste of it, I think, is just horrible. So, yeah, you can even get to the point where you've done it once or twice, and then all you need to do is smell it, and it's anchored uh, into your brain that you don't even need to put it in your mouth. I have a funny clove story. But well, I'll, go ahead, I'll share it with you. Sometime. Oh, you don't want to tell the story? <laughs> so the first time I took, I bought the clove essential oil. Yeah. The first time I took it was in my car at a stoplight. And I dipped one drop on my tongue oh, God. with no water. And I was like vomiting. <laughs> yeah. okay, uh, so I, you must don't do that. Do not drink. Do, do not, not just do put that. a drop on your tongue. It no, is disgusting. Erin, oh, you missed the God. point when I've said over a dozen times, in water, swish, <laughs> and spit. <laughs> anyway, um, do you have time for one more? Or Yeah. Sure. And then so we're going to do another, I know we're going to be on another time. So we'll be able yeah, to answer. In a couple of weeks. Well, we'll I guess I'll read the question. It might be something you want to get into next time. Um, Cause we have two questions that are kind of contradicting each other. So it's about trauma. So one of the questions is can past trauma cause food addiction? If so, why, and how do we combat it? And the other question about trauma, which is a little bit opposite of that is, what do you think about evolutionary psychologists like Doug Lyle who don't think trauma in our lives affects um, us like current culture does? That that could be a whole yeah. one hour talk. So I don't know if you're going to go over well, trauma in a food I mean, addiction. I, I guess I guess let's pretend that there is no trauma. Let's pretend there's no trauma in the world. You don't have any trauma, and you're a food addict. So something's causing the food addiction, right? So either way, we have to sanitize your environment. We can't dance with the devil. We got to find things that bring us pleasure in life other than food. And we got to keep moving our body and learning to love ourselves. So when people want to, when people say there's no such thing as trauma, okay, let's pretend there's no trauma. My formula is still the same thing other than I'm just not recommending you go see a trauma therapist. But all I'd ask you is this, is that, when somebody breaks up with their boyfriend or girlfriend, do you know anybody who goes home and eats a pint of ice cream and a, and a whole roll of Oreo cookies? Oh yeah. When they weren't eating them before? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Why are they eating them? Yeah. I mean, if somebody had a trauma event and they, is it possible that as a kid they got beat up and now they become an alcoholic or they witnessed a terrible thing and then they took drugs? Why should processed food be any different than the drugs? That's all I'm saying. I'm not going to, I'm not a doctor, so I'll let the doctors debate that. But my formula is going to still be the same, whether you believe in trauma or you don't, it's still going to be the same thing. Sanitize your environment. Don't dance with the devil. Find things in life that are enjoyable, that give you pleasure other than the processed ding dong. No, this, this, this has been wonderful. So for those of you, and I know some of you have, a lot of you have submitted questions. We are going to save those questions and we will address those questions at a later time. I want to thank our special guest, John Pierre, for this evening's talk. It was absolutely wonderful. 
And um, if you haven't subscribed to our channel, please do so. Please go into the show notes as I have posted JP's email address, his livingwithharmony.org uh, website. I have posted everything there. And if you want to get in touch with JP to have him coach you, I cannot, I mean, I recommend him highly. Um, he is just absolutely fantastic. I want to thank you, JP, for tonight. And um, we look forward to more conversations with you. And I want to mention that I will be having a retreat in Chicago next Memorial Day. So um, make sure to go to johnpierre.com and at the very bottom where you can fill out the, your form to, to get a free newsletter, we'll be announcing it there too. And that will probably be within the next couple of weeks. We're only taking a small amount of people as these retreats are very, very intimate and they're very powerful in terms of healing. So we won't have a you know very large crowd. So make sure that you get on that list so you can be notified once we release those uh, times and everything. I am truly looking forward to, to that um, retreat. And I know Aaron's looking Yay. forward to it. So that's, that's really, really exciting news. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us tonight. Thank you, John Pierre. And we look forward to talking to you soon. Have a good night. Bye, everyone. everyone. Thank <laughs> you.